This lecture by Ram Das, Aging and Change, was held at the Omega Aging Conference in New York, May 1, 1992. Good morning. I want to express my appreciation to Omega for creating this opportunity for us to be together. Eve, is, uh, Eve Elson is uh, Zalman's partner. Since I'm going to be talking about change, I'd just like her to share with you a very beautiful song uh, by Stevie Wonder called Everything Must Change. Everything must change Nothing stays the same Everyone must change no one and nothing goes unchanged the young become the old mysteries unfold for that's the way of time no one and nothing goes unchanged There are not many things in life you can be sure of Except rain comes from the clouds And sun lights up the sky And hummingbirds must fly And winter turns to spring a wounded heart must heal, but never much too soon. No one and nothing goes unchanged. The young become the old, mysteries unfold. That's the way of time. No one, nothing goes unchanged. There are not many things in life you can be sure of, except rain comes from the clouds, and sun lights up the sky, and hummingbirds must fly. And everything must change. Last year I was on a late evening train and the station was closed so I had to buy the ticket on the train. I had just become 60. So when the conductor came, I said to him, um, I'd like a senior citizen ticket. And what I felt when I did that was just what I had felt when I was 18 years old. <laughs> and. I had been from Boston where the drinking age was 21, but I went to New York with some friends and the drinking age was 18 and I went into a bar and I said, I'd like a beer with trepidation that they wouldn't serve me because I was too young. I had the same feeling with the conductor. <laughs> and, but he immediately made out the ticket for the senior citizen. Huh? I said to him, don't you want to see my ID? And he said, no. <laughs> and I was shocked. <laughs> because until I was 50, I think I saw myself as somewhere between 12 and 14. <laughs> and then around 50, I started to grow up and I began to consider the fact that I was possibly an adult.
So that uh, in earlier years when I had been in my 30s and a student would come in and say, uh, Sir, may I see you? <laughs> I would take it as a joke. <laughs> I treated age as uh, rather uninteresting. I was busy being spiritual and spiritual people don't focus on age of the body. So, but I decided when I was 60 to milk it, to see what I could get out of it, to see if there was any work I should do. So instead of, usually I'm traveling during my birthday so people can't have birthday parties, but this time I told everybody I wanted birthday parties and I had many birthday parties. And because 60 was a key year, I uh, have studied in the East a great deal and at 60 you become a sannyas, which uh, in the stages of life, uh, from 0 to 20, the ashramas or stages of life, from 0 to 20, you're a student. From 20 to 40, you're a householder, raising your children, earning money. From 40 to 60, you start to do spiritual studies and pilgrimages and practices. And at 60, you throw over everything, and you are a total, you're totally free. 60 is such a key point in this country, it's a little more confusing because you don't know whether you retire at 55 or 60 and Medicare is until 65, and so you don't quite know when the mark is. There's no clear rite of passage as to when you're old. But I really wanted to milk it. I realized that I got caught in it. And for about six months, I was really busy being 60. I looked at my hand and I saw my father's hand and I thought, there's a 60-year-old hand. You know? Bone and blood vessels and wrinkles and spots. Wow, spots. You know? you know, the Porcelana ad says, it says they call these spots aging spots. I call them ugly. Is that an extraordinary ad, I mean, to create suffering? I mean, the other way of looking is they call these ugly. I call them aging spots. <laughs> but what it, I had done was I had internalized at some level, more or less consciously, the social clock of aging of our society. Because we are basically a hunting tribe, and what happens to old people in hunting tribes, since hunting tribes have to keep moving, is old people are left behind and they're treated as somewhat irrelevant. And since economic productivity and social roles of uh, achievement are so stressed in this society, in uh, this youth society, um, I began to feel like it was time for closings rather than openings. I should look at the projects I had left to do. Maybe I should consider retiring from Seva Foundation. Maybe I should do my last book. I mean, I was really climbing into it. I, maybe I should take six months a year now off. And I started to notice I travel and I use carry-on baggage because I don't like baggage claim waiting. So I noticed that the corridors to the plane seem to be getting longer. I thought, aha, uh -huh, it's happening. And I reacted to it uh, in an interesting ways. Part of me was sort of steeping myself in okay, what's it going to be like to be older? I'll slow down, I'll honor this. And the other part was doing this bizarre behavior where uh, last summer I spent uh, some time helping my colleague build his house with adobe bricks. And uh, I would be in this long line of people, all of whom were about 20 to 30 year old Mexican laborers, and me and my friend, and the bricks weighed about 30 to 40 pounds, and we would toss them up the hill from one to another, and we would work from 7.30 in the morning till 5 at night, at which point they'd go out to dinner and to play, and I would stagger to bed. <laughs> but I wouldn't give up. I did it. And um, then I thought, well, my body's out of shape. So I went to Gold's Gym, <laughs> and I got a trainer. And now Gold's Gym is wonderful because it's where everybody comes with all those kind of really muscle-bound, huge forms, you know, these things that, you know. And they have mirrors all around the sides for these people who admire themselves, but because I'm nearsighted without my glasses, I couldn't see in the mirrors. All I saw were these huge forms going by. And
So pretty soon I was starting to walk like this, because <laughs> since I couldn't see myself, I just assumed I was one of them. And, uh, <laughs> But the trainer, as we went through the uh, regimen, at one point I was sitting there deciding whether I would live or die, and she said, are you all right? And I knew she wouldn't be asking that to one of them, so... <laughs> I remembered my father's little poem, it's not the crow's feet under your eyes that make you old, or the gray in your hair, I'm told, but when your mind makes a contract your body can't fill, you're over the hill, brother, you're over the hill. <laughs> but I wasn't ready to give up, so in November I went with a 33-year-old friend of mine to the South Pacific to do two months of boogie boarding. For those of you that don't know that it might have passed you by, a boogie board is a, a plastic board, and you go out in the waves and you ride on the wave. So I found myself in Tahiti and in the Marquesas Islands, and my friend would leap into the surf and rush out to get the waves, and these waves are coming in, and uh, I would be struggling to get through the wave, and I'd get out there, and there were all these, uh, not only weren't they 60 years old, they weren't 50, and they weren't 40, and they weren't even 30. I mean, they were about 15. Only one person gets a wave, it turns out, if you really want to ride the right place. So I was fighting these 15, 20 year olds. And at one point, I took a wrong turn and I ended up on this coral reef with the waves pounding down on me and the coral cutting into my legs. And you know how long it takes for coral to heal. And I, everybody was screaming at me to do something which I couldn't hear over the waves. And I thought, what am I doing? Is it possible that I could say enough already? <laughs> I've saved my father's cane uh, for whenever. There's a, a lovely Chinese story about that, about the um, old Chinese man who's retired, he's too old to work in the garden and he's sitting on the porch and his son is tilling the garden with his son as a wife and family. And the son looks up at the old man and he thinks, you know, he's so old, he just eats food. What good is he? No, it's time for him to be done. So he went out and he made a wooden box and he put the box on the wheelbarrow and he rolled the wheelbarrow up to the porch and he said, Father, get in. <laughs> the father got into the box and the son put the cover on the box and started to wheel the box towards the cliff. And as he got to the edge of the cliff, there was a knocking from inside the box. And he said, yes, father. And the father said, well, I understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, son, but might I suggest that you just throw me over and save the box because your children will probably need it later. But one of the things that's helped me from not getting too trapped in our cultural models is that I do travel a great deal in other cultures. And in other cultures, um, I'm always surprised at how different the feelings are that are generated around um, variables. Like in India, when I went there last time, two years ago, one of my uh, lovely old friends up in the, a village in the mountains said to me, Ramdas, you're looking so old. He said, you're so gray. Now, at first, my reaction to that was my Western cultural reaction of, oh, God, you know, that's terrible. But then when I quieted down, I heard the tone with which he was saying it. He was saying it with great respect and delight. Like, I had now become one of the elders of the society. And he was saying, wow, you've done it. You're, you've grown old. How great. And what I have found is that after I live in places like Guatemala or Malaysia or Thailand or Burma or Italy or France or Spain or Polynesia, where there are extended families where everybody has natural roles within the structure and where old people are part of the families and the old and the young are wise fools together and the whole thing is quite built in, 
Then you come back to where this culture, where we have, quote, an aging problem. And I realized we are gathered here because of our cultural pathology. That were it not for that, we wouldn't need this so much. Because in many cultures, this was all built in, in a natural way. And in our zeal to be independent, we have thrown away the baby with the bath a little bit. And we've ended up where we have alienated ourselves across generations instead of embracing ourselves across generations and creating these kinds of supportive communities where the roles of elders are obvious and clear. In our society, of course, where technology moves so fast, we get outdated so that the question of what wisdom elders have that is useful. I mean, I'm only at word perfect 5-0. And I realize now that I already can't talk the language of my friend's 12-year-old son. You know, I moved from a typewriter to a computer, and I kept saying to myself, old dogs can learn new tricks, old dogs can learn new tricks, old dogs can learn new tricks, and I put it over my computer. But I don't know how many more old tricks I'm going to learn, and I may just decide to be outdated. But I think that we have to recognize that we are living in a system that has gotten out of balance in which the zeal for independence and individuality has left us alienated from the structures not only of family and community, but from nature in, in ways that Zalman was talking about, from recognizing our identity as part of biotic communities and part of other things, that all of which give a, an intuitive, innate meaning to aging. And they give you a feeling of the appropriateness of the place. Most of us live in urban areas where we are living almost totally surrounded by the projections of the human mind. And very rarely are we living so close to nature and earth that we are experiencing in our blood and our being the cycles of cold and warm, of leaves falling, of the feelings of nature, of death, of birth, of aging. It's a harsh reality at one level, and it's, what's the, it's the horrible beauty of the wisdom of nature that we often have shielded ourselves from, and in that shielding, we have lost something because we've been afraid to look at the nature of aging and death. Robert Kastenbaum says, 
the limitations and distortions of our core vision of what it means to be a person in our culture become starkly evident in old age. If to be an old person is to suffer abandonment, disappointment, and humiliation, this is not a geriatric problem. It is the disproof of our whole shaky pudding technology, science, and all. If our old people are empty, our vision of life is empty. Now, as Eve's song talked about, the changes, Stevie Wonder's song, the nature of aging has to do with change, obviously. And the nature of changing phenomena is that they are endlessly fascinating. We get fascinated with that which changes. When it starts to happen to who we think we are, the fascination turns into fear. The first level of change that we have to attend to is the physical nature of change with aging. As I read this list, it'll be very familiar to many of you. Arthritis, neuritis, insomnia, constipation, poor circulation, high blood pressure. I went to the doctor the other day and he said, you have high blood, he said, your blood pressure is high. He said, would you do whatever you do to lower it? I said, what I do to lower it is not visit doctor's offices. That's what I do. It's called the, the white coat blood pressure. Nervous tension, atrophying muscles, bones breaking easily, motor nerve signals slower. Lungs less oxygen, loss of mobility, can't hear as well, can't see as well, run out of steam sooner, days when you feel sick and nauseous, questions about continence. Now those changes themselves are so fascinating <laughs> that I can take you to whole societies 
in the sun in St. Petersburg, for example, where there are hundreds of thousands of people who are endlessly reciting the lists of these changes <laughs> to each other. Mostly their own fascinate them the most, however, they do listen to each other so that they can give fair hearing, so that they can have time for their own. But you don't say, how are you? <laughs> and that's real, and it's very real, and it's very painful, and very confusing, because the body just doesn't do what it used to do, and it does a lot of things it didn't used to do. And while you can see how real that is for those people, when you put in the places of those people who are the same age, now just put on those benches, Einstein, Arthur Rubinstein, Pablo Picasso, Rembrandt, George Bernard Shaw, Monet Chagall, Bob Hope, Grandma Moses, and Margaret Mead. And you can't imagine them sitting around doing that same thing, can you? So it's clearly not age, is it? It's where the mind grabs hold and which changes it focuses on, right? I mean, just, that's a... Now, around that one is so endlessly fascinating, we've developed a great deal of um, humor around it. Johnny Carson says, I know a man who gave up smoking, drinking, sex, and rich food. He was healthy right up to the time he committed suicide. <laughs> Groucho Marx said, in middle age you go to bed knowing you'll, hoping you'll feel better in the morning, in old age you go to bed hoping you'll have a morning. <laughs> Robert Benchley said, I feel fine at 50 except for an occasional heart attack. <laughs> These identifications are so intense, it's extremely hard to break them, but as you heard, you could feel that it was possible to lift out of them and to see the body as a vehicle. In the East, you see the body as something you have incarnated into, and it's a vehicle that, it's like a spacesuit for working on this planet, on this plane of reality. And your spacesuit, I have an old, I have a, two cars, one is 19 years old and one's 18 years old. Now, to me, they're new cars because I remember them. But one of them just failed the smog test in California, and it's. And I realize now that um, it's just a car. But to be able to say it's just a body in the same way, because most of us have identified so with the. It's like identifying with your car, and somebody says, uh, "How do you do? Who are you?" And you say, "I'm a Ford." <laughs> you know, like I'm an arthritic. Like, I have gout. How do you do? I have gout. You know? It's the same thing. You're identifying with the vehicle. I mean, it's, it's a charming old vehicle. It's just falling apart. But I can, with a little tender care, I can keep it together for a little while longer. However, when you get to the psychological things that change, it's a whole other ball game. When you work with the psychological changes, because there are a lot of new ones you face that are psychological changes. Some of them just increase and some of them appear that have never appeared before. Let me give you a little list to play with. You, got the, you handled the physical list well? Try this one. Despair. Depression. Feeling abandoned. Lonely. Worthless. Frustrated, worrying, doubting.
vulnerable, forgetful, losing self-confidence, petty, irritable, fear of the future, obsessed with possessions, meaninglessness, friendlessness, fear of being penniless, no one to touch, loss of psychological power, worship and fear of doctors, suspicion, paranoia, Those all sound pretty real. And they are coming and going and appearing more and more frequently and changing. As your social support system changes, as you may have to leave the home, as you may have to lose friends, as you may have to find that you have less responsibility, as the reward systems you work for don't work anymore. You try to maintain psychological security by going, holding on to things as they are. And if you can hear the predicament that everything is cha things change. Things change. My car gets old. My body gets old. That's obvious. The hard one to hear is that thoughts and feelings are things and things change. And that your identification with your thoughts and feelings is another source of the cause of the suffering. What we usually do under those conditions is we work in a therapeutic sense, psychologically, to try to find some psychological model that will allow us to age and we try to substitute that for the one that is depressed and fearful and frightened. It's a horizontal shift. And there are certain qualities that we look for, we try to cultivate. Martin Buber says, to be old is a glorious thing when one has not, when one has not unlearned what it means to begin. He's talking about somebody who knew how to begin. He said, he was not at all young, but he was old in a young way, knowing how to begin. And most of the social programs that are not for the physical body are for psychological well-being. And they're in supporting education, the elder hostel, travel. If you read the AARP magazine, Modern and Maturity, you just see lots of stuff around keeping your psychological mental health good and your physical health good. Continue to do things, to be active, etc. To see aging as a challenge, as a psychological challenge. A challenge that is sufficient to motivate you to grow, but not so extreme so as to induce depression, regression, in other words, not beyond our adaptive capacity. To psychologically study the way in which we are responding to change in a habitual way that is similar to the way we responded to change at puberty, the way we responded to change in childhood and realize we're just reliving psychological patterns over and over again and to break our, break our habits and get out of those things. Part of the psychological mental health of elders and aging has to do now with political power, with the Great Panthers, with the AARP, with power, with, as uh, Zalman said, the baby boom and the power. Now every bus will be a kneeling bus because we have the votes. Now that's a good example of something that is extremely useful and important and relevant when older people say, look, we are not going to be disempowered by a youth culture. We're going to redefine the game of what this culture respects. And we're not going to wait for somebody else to give it to us. We're going to take it. And we're going to take it with our...
our political power. That is great. But I want to represent another voice here and say, do that and do it effectively. Don't get trapped in it. Don't get trapped in worldly power because the business of aging has some other agenda to it as well. One of the things that eldering allows us to do, or aging rather, has, allows us to do is become more eccentric. That's a psychological shift in role. Before, where you had to be a certain way, now you can sort of let it all fall apart a little bit more. There's a wonderful poem that many of you know, I'm sure, by Jenny Joseph. It's a warning. She said, when I am an old woman, I shall wear purple with a red hat which doesn't go, and it doesn't suit me. And I shall spend my pension on brandy and summer gloves and satin sandals and say, we've no money for butter. I shall sit down on the pavement when I'm tired and gobble up samples in shops and press alarm bells and run my stick along the public railings and make up for the sobriety of my youth. I shall go out in my slippers in the rain and pick the flowers in other people's gardens and learn to spit. You can wear terrible shirts and grow more fat and eat three pounds of sausage at a go or only bread and pickles for a week and hoard pens and pencils and beer mats and things in boxes. Ah, but now we must have clothes to keep us dry and pay the rent and not swear in the street and set a good example for the children. We must have friends to dinner and read the papers. But maybe I ought to practice a little now so people who know me are not too shocked and surprised when suddenly I am old and start to wear purple. That's, of course, T.S. Eliot's proof rock. I grow old, I grow old, I shall wear the bottoms of my trousers rolled. Shall I put my hair, part my hair behind? Do I dare to eat a peach? I shall wear white flannel trousers and walk upon the beach. I have heard the mermaids singing each to each. I do not think that they will sing to me. And one more poem that I found in a um, Hallmark card. <laughs> because the, uh, of course, the psychological fear that we have the most is of losing our mind. And um, this says, just a line to say I'm living, that I'm not among the dead, though I'm getting more forgetful and form more mixed up in the head. But sometimes I can't remember when I stand at the foot of the stair if I must go up for something or if I've just come down from there. <laughs> And before the fridge, so often my poor mind is full of doubt. Have I just put food away or have I come to take some out? <laughs> and there are times when it's dark out with my nightcap on my head. I don't know if I'm retiring or just getting out of bed. So if it's my turn to write you, there's no need in getting sore. I may think that I have written and don't want to be a bore. <laughs> Remember, I do love you. I wish you were here and it's nearly mail time. So I'll say goodbye, dear. There I stood beside the mailbox with my face so very red. Instead of mailing you my letter, I have opened it instead. <laughs> I... I love my new bifocals. My dentures fit me fine. My hearing aid is perfect, but Lord, I miss my mind. <laughs> Now, it's much harder to hear the possibility that one can extricate oneself from that which changes when the changes involves one's own personality. Because while you may be able to see the body as object, it's very hard to see the personality as object because you've identified with it for so long. You think that's who you are. And now we're getting more into the depth of the matter because the question one asks is, is there a place to stand in relation to change 
where one is. is not uh, frightened by it. Is there a place to stand in the presence of change where one can be with the changes, even enjoy the changes, work with the changes, become an elder, do all the things that changing involves, and at the same moment cultivate equanimity, spaciousness, emptiness, awareness, clarity? And that's really what the issue of spiritual, of the, the deep spiritual work is about. Now, there are stages of that work, and the first stage, I think, is the recognition of what is most comfortable for people in spiritual dimension is something called soul, which, re which says you are still a separate entity, but you aren't the incarnation. You aren't what was born, so you aren't your personality and you aren't your body. Here are just a few images to work with in thinking about this. One is by Yeats. An aged man is but a paltry thing, tattered coat upon a stick. In less soul claps its hands and sing and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. O oh, sages standing in God's holy fire, be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire, and fastened to a dying animal. It knows not what it is, and gather me into the artifice of eternity. Pull my soul out of the identification with the body. And in Eliot, T.S. Eliot's poem, East Coker, As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the pattern more complicated of dead, of living. Old men and women ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving into another eternal intensity for further union, a deeper communion, through the dark, cold, and empty desolation, the wave cry, the wind cry, the vast waters of the petrol and the porpoise. In my end is my beginning. You and I are paying the price of having grown up in such a materially oriented society, such an externalized society, such a society that measures people in terms of their products, their achievements, their possessions, their knowledge. 
instead of cultivating the quality of being. In the East, one spends one's life, it's in the, in, from a spiritual sense, in preparing for aging and death. We have spent most of our lives in denying aging and death. And the predicament we face now is that once we become older, when we suddenly realize there is another agenda, it's harder to do it now because it's harder to not be distracted by all of the changes that are happening in our bodies and our minds. And that is why you are encouraged spiritually. It says, die in the morning so you need not die at night. And that has to do with go through the spiritual transformations when you are young so that when you get old, you will have built up the resonance within yourself to be able to transform the changes without getting caught in them. Mahatma Gandhi had spent so many years in inner spiritual practice and with the mantra he did, Ram, 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 with his, with his beads, Ram, 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 that when he walked out into the garden, that day, and a man came up and shot him four times at blank range, right in the chest. As Gandhi was falling over, he didn't say, oof, or save India, or you are forgiven. He said, Ram. He was so ready to move forward that at the moment, the unexpected moment, he was ready to utter that mantra which would take him into the next phase. The depth of the understanding of that particular image, of the preparation, not just for the moment of death, but for the process of aging, it is a lifetime's work. To know how to grow old is the master work of wisdom, one of the most difficult chapters in the great art of living and one best done early on. T.S. Eliot has one other quote. He says, we cannot stick to the moving finger of time on the surface of the sphere, but must des descend into the still point of the turning world. That is, one of the traps that our mind is in is the trap of time. 
and aging has to do with time. And the, I must ask you, is there a part of you that is not in time? And if so, find it and rest in it. That's the whole mystical journey. Now the predicament is, the part of you that is not in time, you can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't hear it, you can't even think about it, and yet it is. You can only be it. You can't know it, because the thinking mind knows objects, and objects are in time. What a frustrating thing. It's like having a flashlight that you shine on this and that, on a memory, on a plan, on a sensation, on a feeling. But when does the flashlight shine on itself? And the flashlight itself is that part of you which you could call, whatever you call it is just going to be a word which isn't going to be it, but let's call it awareness. Awareness has no time. It has no space. It doesn't die. It wasn't born. It's not going anywhere. Everybody is having continuous experience or continuous understanding or resting in awareness, but you are so fascinated with what you're being aware of, you never notice the awareness itself. Isn't that strange? What you begin to see is the way in which the journey, the spiritual journey, is one of going deeper and deeper into your being to go in behind that which changes to find that which does not change. And it's not a that, but find not change. And in that process, you start to use the things of your life as your vehicles of doing it. And all of the things I've talked about, the physical breakdown, the psychological breakdown, all can become the stuff you use in order to go behind it by saying, not this, not this, not this. And when you know how to use aging to go behind time, then you begin to see that all of that stuff that's happening to you not only might not be bad, it might even be grace. There's a story of the man who had a horse, and the horse ran away, and his neighbor came up and said, oh, that's terrible. And the man said, you never know. And the next day, the horse came back, and it was leading two other wild horses. And the neighbor said, that's wonderful. And the farmer said, you never know. And then his son was training one of the wild horses, and while he was riding the wild horse, he fell off and broke his leg. And the neighbor came up and said, that's terrible. And the farmer said, <laughs> And then the Cossack army came through recruiting everybody, taking all the young men that were able, but they didn't take the son because he had a broken leg. And the neighbor came up and said, that's wonderful. And the farmer said, <laughs> And on it goes, you see. <laughs> You begin to experience that the very stuff of aging becomes stuff to work with for your spiritual journey. There are some advantages of aging in that you are like the Chung Tzu's old gnarled tree that no woodsman cuts down anymore. So it can do its own business.
you become irrelevant so you can do inner work. <laughs> Here's Francis, a resident in a nursing home. She says, lack of physical strength keeps me inactive and often silent. They call me senile. Senility is a convenient peg on which to hang nonconformity, she says. <laughs> a new set of faculties seems to be coming into operation. I seem to be waking to a larger world of wonderment, to catch little glimpses of the immensity and diversity of creation. More than at any other time of my life, I seem to be aware of the beauties of our spinning planet and the sky above. Old age is sharpening my awareness. That's senility. I had an extraordinary image of this when I was taking care of my father, who died about three years ago at 90. And over the years, my father had been a very effective political, social animal, very successful. As he got older, during the last three years, he got very quiet inside. And uh, he just smiled a lot. And I used to sit with him and hold his hand, and we'd look at sunsets. We had never done that all our lives, because we were always busy, what do we do now? You know, that kind of active world. So uh, a man came to visit, a relative came to visit my father, who had never gotten along well with him. And he said, uh, hi, how are you doing? And my father just smiled at him. And the fellow walked out of the room and he said, that bastard, he still won't talk to me. <laughs> and then my aunt came along, who loved my father incredibly. She said, George, how are you? And he just smiled at her. And she said, oh, poor George, what have they done to you? Where are you? They've gone, you've gone away. There he and I were sitting. We were both in ecstasy, just sitting and smiling. We were totally at peace. He was, it was like washing the Buddha all the time. It was incredible. I mean, he was just blissed out all the time. He didn't even know himself. They were both miserable. Isn't that interesting? They were miserable because their model of who he should be because of who he was, but that isn't who he is. And the interesting question is whether you will allow the moment to be real or not. The wonderful line, the very frailty of age guards its secrets. The inner world of the old is seldom worded. To speak of half-formed ideas which come with attunement to inner self is to destroy their growth said Margaret Keyes. See, when I say to you, you are looking for a place in you that is not form, that is not in time, that is not in space, it's not something you can talk about. All your words are just fingers pointing at the moon, they're not the moon. And when you get old and you can't talk so much, then you're in a position where you may be able to hear those components that are not talkable about. Otherwise, you keep reducing the world to what you can talk about. It's so interesting how age works to the advantage spiritually. You know, I go to Burma, say, to sit in meditation for two months. I go into a cell, I sit down, no books, no letters, no television, nobody to talk to, nowhere. I just sit and I just sit and go inward. And I go into as quiet a place as I can. But look what happens when you get old. You go deaf, you're blind, you've got arthritis, you can't move around. What an ideal time to meditate. I mean, if any message was clearer, that's it. Isn't that the optimum time to be able to sit down and shut up? and really listen inward. And yet we treat it as if it's an error or a failing. Isn't that bizarre? Seems so to me. The next issue, of course, that we have to deal with is the issue of dying. Suzuki Roshi said, life is like setting sail aboard a boat which is about to go out into the ocean and sink. <laughs> You ready for that? <laughs> not me. I'm not going to sink. I have a life preserver. And Rilke said that one can contain death, the whole of death.
can hold it to one's heart gentle and not refuse to go on living is inexpressible. The key spiritual work that aging demands we focus upon is the way in which we relate to death. And the way you relate to death is a function of how much you are identified with that which dies. When you were born, you were undifferentiated all of it. And then you went into somebody training. And you became somebody. You became a defined, boundaried somebody. You were trained by people who thought they were somebody. And in the zeal with which you were trained into your somebodyness, what you lost was your connection with the unity that exists behind the diversity. You just got so focused on your separateness, you lost the unity. And the spiritual journey is awakening back into the unity, the oneness, the spirit, the God that permeates and is all things. Not so that you get lost in the unity and forget the diversity or you're unique, but that you regain the balance. Because once you have in you a recognition of that part of you which is part of everything, which is part of the one, your fear of death is dissipated immensely. As long as you are identified only with your separateness, you are afraid of death. And that fear is going to color all of your years. And the art of being able to look directly at death and directly at suffering, that art, the ability to keep your heart open in hell, to look at what is, look at all of it, is a function of your ability to find in yourself that which is not changing, which is not separate, which is not vulnerable to time and to space. That's the spiritual work. That's the journey of aging. So to undertake this spiritual journey, what is required? Zalman talked about doing our philosophical homework. That is, now instead of just reading People magazine, New York Times, whatever, variety, start to look for those kinds of literature, resources, books that reflect about these issues of metaphysics, of who you are and what you're doing here. If you have a religious context, do it through your religious context. The Baal Shem Tov, read, read St. Augustine, etc. Recognize the, the stages of life and honor them. Well, see, I can't honor them because there they are. Confucius said, Confucius, see, I always have one. Confucius said, at 15, I set my heart upon learning. At 30, I had planted my feet firm upon the ground. At 40, I no longer suffered from perplexity. At 50, I knew what were the biddings of heaven. At 60, I heard them with a docile air. At 70, I could follow the dictates of my heart, for what I desired no longer overstepped the boundaries of right. Now, a lot of people talk about old people don't have to give up their sexual appetites. You don't, but when they fall away, what a blessing. <laughs> How much free time you have. I never knew. I mean, I don't want to say undercut the game of old people are sexy. I think that's wonderful and it's sensual and it's all great. But my God, you don't even have to keep playing with toys all your life. There are other business you have. Don't de denigrate it by saying, I failed because I can't get it up or I can't make it or I can't do this. I mean, that's absurd. Well, that's going to certainly. So recognizing and honoring stages of life is extremely important. Look at change itself and reflect about that, as we have been doing here. See how, as I've talked about, losing your hearing as a value, not a loss. See how you can use your aging as a vehicle to help you in your spiritual work.
rather than being something that's an obstacle. Recognizing in yourself the conflicting forces, the forces that make you want to stay effective in the world, having love and friendship and all of that, and the other part that wants to be contemplative and go inside, and really give that contemplative inside part some, some space, water it a little bit, give it some sunlight to grow instead of treating it as, oh God, I don't want to go out today, as if it's some kind of an error. Give yourself psychologically the opportunity to grieve for the end of dreams, for the end of childhood, for all the people that go away, for the loss of each thing, thing upon thing upon thing. The loss of competence, the loss of people, the loss of lifestyle, the loss of your body functioning. Stop feeding the drama of aging. Your denial of aging or your milking of it by being so attached to it are both getting in the way of realizing that who you are has no age. Who you are is in a body that has age, it's in a personality that is aging and changing, but you yourself aren't. Reflect about death and become friendly with it. Find a community around you of people who would like to really grow inwardly if you're lucky enough to find them. They're called satsang or sangha or the family or the community of spirit. If you don't, then you've got books of tzaddiks, of staritzes, of wise women, of all of that. Tune back into nature more deeply so you can feel the cycles, the natural cycles of which your body and your personality are a part. Find practices of meditation, meditation on impermanence, meditation on suffering and the end of suffering, meditation on non-self, meditation on dependency. Learn how to act in the world in caring and compassionate way without being trapped in being the actor, by using it all to go inward more deeply, more deeply. These are the kind of spiritual teachings I work with. You should rest in naturalness. Clear, empty, and naked mind essence, free from any concerns. Just rest in your awareness. When your body falls sick, don't indulge in it, but rest in naturalness. Look into the painful sensation itself. The pain doesn't cease. However, you will directly realize the innate state of awareness, free from any thought about where it hurts, what it hurts, how it hurts, as well as the object of the pain. At that moment, the sickness grows less intense and becomes more insubstantial. Regard disturbing emotions from within the space of emptiness. Any disturbing emotion that may arise is wisdom the moment you relax in naturalness. Look directly into it. Don't deliberately reject it or regard it as a fault or indulge it in concreteness or even regard it as a virtue. Just look at it and keep coming back into spaciousness. The result of the kinds of spiritual work I'm talking about is that you are growing towards being equanimous, peaceful, where you see that the process of the aging is itself the creative act. And you see the way in which you are your own creation. And when you are creating from peace and equanimity and the quiet spaciousness of being in love in the universe, the unity of the universe, you become a wise elder into the society. When you are dependent on others, the way in which you are dependent is a, a message to other people to help them get free of their fear of dependency. The people I work with who are dying, I have to tell you, are my great teachers. They are people who, in the way they work with these processes, keep teaching me. Mahatma Gandhi's line, 
He was on a train, it was rolling out of the station, a reporter rushed up and said, Mahatma Ji, give me a message to take back to the people. He had just time to scribble on a paper bag, he handed out the bag, and it said, my life is my message. I invite you to look at your life and see what message it is you are. And when you find that part of you that is afraid, that is caught in time and that which changes, get to work. There's no better time to do it than now. Thank you.